would do very much. I think if I win, they would be very... I would have never made this deal. This deal, I don't mind making a deal, but Israel is, is just absolutely devastated by this deal with Iran. It's just so bad on so many levels. If you look at what's happened with Iran, it's so incredible. Because not only do they have this great deal, now they have this big bundle of money, they're going to have all the nukes they want, and they're going to cause nuclear proliferation. But what else did they get even better? They got Iraq that they've wanted forever. They'd fight and fight and fight back and forth, fight, fight. They rest. Then they fight because the two militaries were the same. They were the same power, basically. And they'd never get anywhere. This would go on. So on I mean, all of the military people know exactly what I'm saying. It was like automatic. They stopped each other. Now we've decimated Iraq, the military, and Iran has got, we've taken everybody out. We can't even call them. We can't even make a phone call to Iraq. Think of it. We spent two trillion dollars. All of our great soldiers were killed and so badly wounded. We have nothing. We have not anything. Iran is going to take over. I mean, they've already, essentially, they've taken it over. But Iran takes over Iraq with the second largest oil reserves in the world. Now they take over Yemen, but they don't really want Yemen. They want Saudi Arabia because that's right on the line. You know, the Yemen line is the big border with Saudi Arabia. They, they don't want Yemen. They want the oil in Saudi Arabia. So we need a different leader. We need somebody that's respected. We need a military that's much stronger. We need a military that when we speak, we can really speak. We don't need nuclear where, I don't know if anybody saw the 60-minute report, where they did it, which should have never been allowed to go out, should have never been, where the nuclear, we don't even know if they work. Did anybody see that report? It was a scary report. So bad. We are so far behind the times militarily, and we have to strengthen it up. I'm, I'm so much into that. And you know, honestly, uh, making our military strong and modern and really, really top of the line, it's probably the cheapest thing we can do. How do we stop the expansion of ISIS and how do we defeat radical Islam, which is now on American soil? Well, we have to hit it very hard. ISIS, we have to hit so hard. Again, the, you know, what they're doing is incredible. They're intimidating. They're using our internet system better than we, we came up with. We invented the internet. They are radicalizing our youth. They're taking them using the internet. And we can't allow that to happen. We're not going to allow it to happen. We have to hit them hard there, and we're going to work on that. You know, I told people, we, can, we have to stop them at the internet level, and then we have to hit them so hard like they've never been hit, because we do have to end it. Again, I was not in favor of going into Iraq. We have no choice. We have to hit ISIS so hard, and we will end it. We have people, look, I've spoken to many of the military. If we wanted to knock them out, we would knock them out fast. We're being stopped politically. We're being stopped politically from knocking them out. They will get knocked out so fast, your heads will spin. I'm telling you, they will get knocked out very, very fast. And we have no choice but to do that. Uh, radical Islamic terrorism and radical Islam, we have to find out what's going on there, folks. Because there's some bad stuff going on there. Some really bad things. Like the two people, the two people that were radicalized married, they, were, they had bombs all over the floor of their house and, and unit. They had bombs all over the floor. Other people saw the bombs. Why weren't they reported? Why weren't they reported? People saw the bombs. It now comes out. Why weren't they reported? They weren't reported because maybe people didn't mind if they were going to do damage to the United States. Those people are just as guilty in a certain way. Okay? And whether it's dealing at the mosque level or any other level, if we're going to be smart and if we're going to be sharp, we have to be vigilant. And we are not being vigilant. And we have, again, a president that doesn't want to even mention the word or the words. You know, if he's not going to say radical Islamic terrorists, he won't say the words. And you're never going to solve the problem. So we have a problem. And, you know, I called for a ban, a temporary ban. And people said, oh, that's terrible. Three weeks later, they're saying, you know, that's a great idea. Because they're seeing what's going on. And, and, and honestly, all you have to do is look at Europe. We've discussed this before, but all you do is just take a look at Europe. Look at what's going on over there with the tremendous crime wave, the tremendous problems. Uh, we just can't. We have enough problems in the United States without having that one. And that one's a beauty. Somebody said, well, we don't think it would be more than 10% of the people that came in would cause trouble. 
10%. The two people, the two people that got married and radicalized. I guess he was radicalized by her. Who cares? These two people, look at the damage. Look at the horrible destruction. Two people. And they talk about 7 to 10%? Forget it, folks. Not going to happen. And if, if I get, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> You know, we're, just so you know, we're taking thousands of them in as we were sitting here talking about this. In the meantime, there are thousands coming in, partially because of the budget that was passed recently, but there are thousands coming in. If I get in, I hate to say it, they're going back. They're going back. They're going back. I think it's safe to say you know something about social media and Twitter. Um, how do we fight ISIS on social media and are, is, are Facebook and Twitter doing enough? Well, you, can, you have to use, I mean, we were the inventors of all this stuff and you have to use it. It absolutely is imperative. It's great stuff. I use it to Twitter and the Facebook. I have millions of people. I have, I have like, I guess, 12 or 13 million people between Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I use it. I'm sort of like a modern person, right? I communicate. It's unbelievable. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little statement about somebody, you know. I'll say, Jeb Bush is a total stiff. <laughs> and the next minute, I'll be in my apartment, I'll be have the news on. We have breaking news, uh, Donald Trump. It's like within 30 seconds. I say, I say, Ted Cruz is a terrible, terrible liar. The worst I've ever seen. We have breaking news, Donald Cruz. We have to, honestly, we have to use this because it's a modern, it's actually a great way of communicating. Now, we have to use it in moderation, perhaps, and if you become president, it has to be toned down a lot. I fully understand that. I'm like, you know, an intelligent person. I'll tone it down a lot. But I will say it is an amazing way to communicate, uh, and we should be not allowing them to use our way of communicating because what they're doing, they, you take a look. You have kids that you wouldn't even think about. They're being radicalized over the internet by ISIS. We, I know how to stop it. We will not let that happen. And by the way, one thing, when they go out and they won't go, want to go fight for ISIS, you know, someday they're not going to go out. They'll fight for ISIS within our lines. But when they go out, they want to fight for ISIS, they're never coming back into this country again. How about what? King Abdullah of Jordan came to the U.S. Congress, met with Republican leaders last year complaining that our State Department was putting up all kinds of bureaucratic roadblocks, things that he needed to take the fight to ISIS or radical Islam. How would you work with moderate and reform Muslim and Arab leaders in the Middle East like King Abdullah, and how would they uh, fit in with your foreign policy? Well, I know that situation very well. and. Uh he and others that are on our side wanted to do certain attacks that would have wiped out big sections and would have been very positive in terms of hurting ISIS. And our State Department wouldn't allow them to do it. They said, don't do it. You do not act. Do not. You know, they have a lot of power because we give weapons. We give weapons to everybody, by the way. We give so many weapons that we don't even know, for the most part, who we're giving them to. And, you know, in many cases, like the whole fight in Syria, we give weapons to the freedom fighters, right? Here we go with the freedom fighters again. The freedom fighters usually end up being worse than the people that are there in the first place. But we give weapons, a bullet's fired in the air, and the enemy takes over the weapons. You know, we have 2,300 uh, Humvees that are totally armor-plated, the best in the world, right? A, a f they have a fight. First of all, can you believe 2,300? And I always go, you mean 23. You mean 2.3. You, you don't mean 2,300. The enemy takes all our equipment. A young man comes back. He's a, a, the son of a friend of mine. He's been over there for a long time, two or three, I guess, maybe four years. And he said the most, the hardest part, the hardest thing he does, and the thing he hates the most, he looks at the equipment. The enemy has better equipment than we have. They have our best equipment. We give it to people to use, and the enemy captures our equipment, and they have better equipment than we do. We're fighting with older equipment, like the Humvees. You know, a lot of our wounded soldiers, our wounded warriors, they were horribly hurt in Humvee accidents, where, you know, a mine would go off, and they'd get their legs blown off, their arms blown off, they'd just be decimated. And it, with, the new, with the new stuff, you, you go up in the air, but you're okay, okay? I mean, you know, these things are amazing, and they're, they're very strong, very, very protective. The enemy has them. The enemy takes them. 
And we're still driving it around and stuff that's not protected. Uh, I, I just tell you this, Van. Uh, if you people go out and if you do your thing on Saturday, it's so important. You're going to be so happy. You're going to be so proud of what's going to happen with the country. Because some of it's common sense. Like somebody said, are you a conservative? I'm, I'm really a conservative, but I'm also a common sense person. I'm a common sense conservative, you know. But some of, I mean, you know what, and you know what I'm talking about. Some of the stuff is so, so out there. We have to be, I think conservative is great, but we have to be common sense conservatives. We have to be smart. But I, I can tell you, first of all, it's an honor having so many people. It's an honor having those rooms all filled up. It's an honor having thousands of people outside that couldn't even get in. And they're still probably on the bridge trying to get across. But you know what? <laughs> There is a movement going on out there. It was in the cover of Time magazine last week. There's a movement that's unbelievable. And it's almost like a movement of common sense and business and heart, too, because we have heart. We have to take care of our people. We want to have housing. We want to have education. We want to have borders. We want to have all these good things, Van. And I'll tell you what, I think that, you know, in two years and three years and four years, hopefully you'll all remember this because you're going to see things happen that are going to be so much good. And we're going to start winning again as a country. We're going to win a lot. We're going to win again as a country. And you can be proud of your country again. So I appreciate it very much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to be in Buford. Thank you. Thank you.